Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, a carcinoid cancer foundation program brought to you by Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host this week and every week, and I am a filmmaker and a writer, among a few other things. And I've been working with CCF for over 10 years now. It is 2022, getting close to the end of 2022, matter of fact. And I think it was 2010, maybe 2011, when I first started working with them. And in that span of time, uh, we have created, folks, countless videos. I, I always try to put a number to it, and I am always unsuccessful. Uh, maybe hundreds of videos if you if you include uh, the program like you're watching today. We've created live video series like the one you're going to watch today. We've created patient-centric documentaries, treatment-based videos, conference videos, all sorts of videos, but all with the same singular mission, and that is to educate people and spread awareness about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we are here to do today. Now, you may notice that it is about an hour behind our typical schedule. Uh, put out a couple of announcements. So for those that um, saw that, I'm glad that you are here and joining us. For anyone that didn't or for those who couldn't make it, if they reserved that time, just know that you'll always be able to watch this show on replay and, uh, and hopefully still get a lot of value out of it. So if anyone isn't able to make it, uh, let them know that the show is still happening and that we will re repost it. It'll be here on the Facebook page for them. And starting next week, it'll be on uh, YouTube as well. Before we, we get started, we always want to thank our sponsors, Ipsen, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without their help, we couldn't do the show. And we have this disclaimer from them. And that is that the opinions expressed by the guest presenter today, as well as the questions asked by you all, the audience at home, haven't been created or suggested by sponsors of Lunch with the Experts, and CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guests and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. Okay, it's a lot of words, but really that last line is the takeaway. We don't know your specific case, um, so we're going to give you some good general advice, some good answers to your questions, hopefully, but by all means, take that advice and those answers back to your home team, which does know your specific case and make the best plan and path forward for you. Because I am not a medical expert, but one thing I have uh, undoubtedly learned in the past 10 years of working alongside this disease is that each case of this disease is unique and therefore each plan and path forward is as well. Okay, today I am very excited to welcome back to the show, Dr. Matthew Kolke. Dr. Kolke, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. Appreciate you being flexible and uh, and still being able to make it today. I know that people do as well. We've got some great numbers already. Uh, for those uh, that didn't see you first time, might not be familiar with your work, tell me a little bit about uh, what you do and, and, and where you work and the role that you fill in this neuroendocrine tumor community. Absolutely. So my, my current job, um, I'm the chief of hematology oncology at Boston University and Boston Medical Center. Uh, I have really spent most of my career uh, academically and clinically focused on uh, the treatment of patients with neuroendocrine tumors and trying to figure out better treatments um, for our patients there. Uh, so most of your career has been dedicated to, to net patients? It has. It has. How did how, how did that start? I'm I'm always curious about the the entry into this space because I, I, I my hunch is that most people don't set out to to uh, to to serve that community. So how, how did it start for you? That, I, I that uh, I I have gotten that question before, certainly from some of my patients. That while I would love to say uh, you know I always wanted to be a neuroendocrine tumor expert, I, I can't really say that. Right. Um, it it actually happened by accident, in some ways um, during my during my training. Uh, mm -hmm. I, there was a, a patient that I had, and uh, they had neuroendocrine tumor, and uh, at that time it it was a, a conundrum. No one quite knew how to treat them and what the best treatment was. Uh, I ended up giving a as we do in, in medicine, a patient presentation to my colleagues. Um, that ended up leading to a, a paper that was published and things took off from there. It, it, uh, it, it became very clear that, that this was a, a real unmet need. Uh, it's a, it was an area that um, needed new treatments, needed people who had experience um, in, in terms of what to do. Uh, so it was, it was a, a really exciting opportunity, uh, certainly for me, uh, to be able to make a contribution in this area and obviously um, led to, uh, to, to many years of work. 
Yeah, I've I've heard similar sentiments shared is that that, that either the challenge of this disease is is kind of compelling to to someone or or like you said the opportunity to to really have an impact it sounds like. So, uh it's, I'm glad to hear that. So folks Dr. Kolke uh, has quite a bit of experience with this disease specifically, as he just let you know. So go ahead and start sending in your questions. We're going to try to get to as many of them as possible today. Inevitably, we don't get to them all because we have so many. It's kind of a good problem as far as I see it because it, it's the engine, the fuel that keeps the show going. We come back every week so that we can answer your questions. But if we don't get to your question, I urge you to follow up either with us. Uh, you can visit the website right behind me, carsonoy.org, or here on the Facebook page. If you are new to the show, if you are new to this journey, I want to say welcome. I'm glad you found us. And the value of this show, the one you're going to watch today, is really twofold as I see it. The information and the knowledge you're going to get from our guest, Dr. Kolke, but also the camaraderie, the community, the shared experiences and shared stories of other net patients, of other people in the audience. So you can see people are, are commenting and telling us where they're signing on from. I encourage you to embrace this community, reach out, introduce yourself, uh, connect with them. They will embrace you back. And it's an, it's an incredibly, incredibly supportive community. And you see it reflected here in the comments section uh, of the Facebook Live, but it's it also exists in, in real life. And so I encourage you to to reach out to these people because uh, I, I see it every week. I see it every week that, that how much people help each other. So go ahead and start sending in your questions and we are going to start taking them very, very soon. Um, a couple of tips right before we get started to help you formulate your questions in the, in the best way or the best manner to get them answered. Try not to be too case specific. I've kind of alluded to that already putting in all of your uh, nuanced information and your specific case information doesn't necessarily help us get that question answered. It's too dense. It's too much. Asking a bunch of questions in one text block is really hard to read as well. So think about it in short little generic chunks. And I know that a lot of us are struggling with many parts, many uh, aspects of this disease. And I want to try to get to as many of those questions as possible, but it's really uh, easier for me to get those questions answered if you just ask them in little generic chunks and then as you have other ones continue to ask it there is no limit for how many questions you can ask and a lot of our guests uh ask many throughout the show and get many answered so that will help me uh help you and then finally if you see someone you guys do a great job of this every week if you see a question in the sidebar that you also have or uh that you're interested in the answer to, you can like it. There's a little button right below the comment that you can like it, love it. Any of the emotions Facebook allows you to use, they all work the same way for me. And that is to effectively upvote that question. If I see eight people have the same question, I'm going to make sure to get that across uh, to our guests today. So that helps a lot as well. Okay. Uh, first question coming in, Dr. Kolke from Cecile. <sighs> Why does my husband's chromogranin A levels uh, go up? Why do they go up while on chemo? He's been on for about three months now. Any any yeah. correlation there? Chromogranin A is a it's a it's a uh, interesting topic here. So we can take a, a bit of a step back in terms of cancer generally, and and the big thing or has been actually for a while is to find what we call biomarkers, markers in the blood that will tell us early on if a treatment is working or not. Uh, and for some cancers, uh, there are some great biomarkers and they correlate really, really well. For neuroendocrine tumors, it's been a, a real challenge finding a biomarker that is uh, really accurate 100% of the time. Chromogranin is, is probably the most commonly used and, and remains actually one of the best ones we still have. That being said, it is not perfect. There's a lot of other things that can make chromogranin go up. Uh, one of the common ones, for example, is if you're on a proton pump inhibitor uh, for acid and digestion or ulcers, that'll make the chromogranin level go up. So it's not perfect. Uh, we get chromogranin, we take a look at it, um, but it doesn't always give the whole story. Um, and at the end of the day, it's really how you're feeling and, and perhaps what the scans are showing in terms of what the tumors are doing. Got it. Thank you. Um, let me know if you have any other uh, 
questions uh, about that. If always, if there's any questions that pop up or follow up questions uh, from your question, please let us know um, and give me a little bit of context uh, as you write your second question. Um, so I get a lot of questions, obviously, about uh, um, about this. Uh, Greg says, is a common side effect of sandostatin, 30 milligrams LAR, uh, is a common side effect fatigue? I would say usually not. Um, fatigue is, a, is tough. There's so many different things that can cause it. And that includes uh, having a carcinoid tumor itself, um, as well as many other types of, of, of tumors. The uh, sandostatin and, or all of the somatostatin logs in general can have some side effects. Um, sometimes it can cause some abdominal cramping. Um, there may even be some rare indirect side effects that could be associated with fatigue. Uh, it can change your heart rate sometimes. We look at thyroid function. So I guess my answer there would be, it's not so much a direct side effect, but there may be some other things to check that could be causing that fatigue, and it would be worth looking at those potential causes. Got it. Thank you. Um, next question from Eric. I was lucky enough to have genomic testing done on my biopsy tissue that identified an NTRK1 fusion. Out of the last four years, I've been treated with CAPTAM twice, total of 18 months. Da, 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 da. The question is, do you routinely order genomic testing for your grade two and grade three well-differentiated net patients uh, to give three and 1,000 patients the opportunity to have another option for treatment, possibly prolonging their lives by the amount of time on these treatments? And if not, why not? Did you, did you stay with me for that? I, I did. So <laughs> uh, genomic testing is a super exciting area. Uh, and increasingly, I think genomic testing is uh, really becoming standard of care. Uh, I can say at, at our institution, we are now reflex testing, basically just automatically uh, testing tumors to, to look for targets. The, the, the thing with neuroendocrine tumors is that when we had a relatively limited number of genomic alterations to look at, um, it ended up being quite rare to find alterations that were actually targetable with drugs. Um, NTREC happens to be one that is in fact targetable. Uh, so I, I think I would say at this point that uh, getting uh, genomic testing potentially can be helpful. Uh, there are a number of treatments that we're using that don't rely on the genomic test. So does it have to be done right up front? Maybe not. Uh, but certainly at, at, at some point down the road, I, I think it is helpful uh, and should be done. And I would have the same answer actually for any other type of cancer. Got it. Thank you. From Kara, Hi, I hope you are well, and thank you for everything you did for me. So maybe this is a patient. Uh, I have recently completed four rounds of PRRT with my last MRI showing no tumor decrease but stabilization. Uh, is that, in your opinion, uh, an acceptable result? So with any cancer treatment, actually, that we, we define success in different ways. Um, at the end of the day, it's really how, how you're feeling. And if you're feeling better or at least not feeling worse, um, that is a good result given what, what sometimes we're faced with. Um, so this is going to be an, an individualized question. But um, generally, since we know that tumors tend to grow over time, if they are not treated, um, preventing growth is, is certainly a success. Um, Certainly shrinkage is even better, uh, but if we're able to keep things from getting worse and keep people feeling good, um, we'll, we'll take that. Thanks, Kara. Appreciate your question. Um, next question from Kimmy. Kimmy says, what are your thoughts 
on the lanreotide injection causing side effects such as weakened bones, more, uh, you know, in parentheses, more likely to get fractures, slower healing from wounds and heightened anxiety symptoms, uh, plus ex uh, experiencing hair loss. Do you feel like the shot being a synthetic hormone can cause more issues for some? Maybe we, we can take a bit of a step back in, in, this, uh, in this question and just think about what are we using somatostatin analogs for? So what are, let's start with the, what the benefits are. Um, and they're really several uh, for people who have symptoms of hormone secretion like the carcinoid syndrome or others. Um, somatostatin analogs can be very effective in suppressing that. And we also know that somatostatin analogs can help slow down tumor growth. We tend to start just about all patients on somatostatin analogs as a first line treatment. In, in large part, um, number one, because they work, but also because given the other options, the side effect profile is so favorable um, compared to a, a lot of cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, or other treatments. Um, people can do great on somatostatin analogs. Does that mean that they have no side effect whatsoever? It doesn't. Um, they do have some, we just talked about some of the potential side effects, um, not always that common, but they can occur. Uh, so certainly we need to keep that in mind, but uh, most times those side effects are not severe enough that they outweigh the, the benefits of, of these sorts of treatments. Got it. Thank you so much for your question. Next one, next one comes from Noreen. Uh, folks, really quickly, I see, I'm seeing what seems to be a lot of new names. And so uh, I want to reiterate that if you are new to the show, new to this journey, uh, welcome. Appreciate you being here and glad you found us. Um, Noreen says, I had a carcinoid tumor found and removed on my appendix 2009. I was then told surgery was a complete treatment. Should I be seeking out a specialist to see if everything is still okay? Uh, wondering if I need follow up now that they know more about them. That's fair. That's a fair question, I think. That is a fair question. Um, the so I think if we, we first sort of think about the the timing here, and and this would be true, I would say for most neuroendocrine tumors. Um, in terms of the the duration of follow up, how long you should be followed after for surgery to check for recurrence, it's actually an open question. Um, for, for most other cancers, there's this five-year cutoff. After five years, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And because neuroendocrine tumors often grow so slowly, which is actually a good thing, um, we not uncommonly will, will follow folks at least 10 years uh, and just to, to be sure things are okay. Um, so, so I, I would I would use maybe the ten year time frame um, as a as a benchmark perhaps for how long you should be followed, and certainly some people might be comfortable getting followed even longer than that. With appendiceal carcinoid tumors or appendiceal neuroendocrine tumors, if they are small and taken out fully with an appendectomy, and by small we usually mean less than two centimeters, the, the risk of recurrence is very very low. Uh, and I think you don't necessarily need to get followed that long, uh, depending on the specific situation there. So I, I think the answer specifically would depend a little bit on what the risk was felt to be at the time of that initial surgery. Got it. Thanks, Doreen. Um, glad to hear from you. And let me know if you have any other questions. Let's see. Agnieszka says, in case of uh, in 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 a case where the head of the pancreas tumor uh, was KI sixty seven and one percent, not hormone active, size is one centimeter. The question is, uh, is would ablation be a good option? Potentially. So there is a these are these are awesome questions, by the way, because people are bringing up things that are actually debated hotly at all sorts of it happens meetings. every week so there's, there's <laughs> not a right and a wrong answer um i think of ablation i i would uh not the most common thing to do in in the pancreas and, and there are risks that you, there again I, I would probably defer to an interventional radiologist or surgeon to mm -hmm. get a better risk assessment of that 
However, the, the, the question, and this comes up all the time with small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, the, the, the general teaching or thought here is that if, if they are low grade, as this one is, and they are small and two centimeter cutoff is one that's used pretty commonly. In some cases, you might just be able to follow that. Sometimes they just sit there and do nothing for years and years and years, and you don't necessarily need to risk a surgery. Uh, that, of course, means that you need to be followed and have imaging and all that. Um, other uh, individuals might prefer to, to just have it taken out and have it removed. And here for the small ones, there, there are options other than a, a major pancreatic resection, which can be a big deal, um, to use a smaller type of surgery to, to remove it. Um, so I, I think my thought here is in terms of, of thinking about those options, um, certainly make sure you, you, you see a surgeon who has some experience and can talk to you more specifically uh, about what this the exact options might be in the situation. Got it. Thank you. Next question from Bill. How are Everlimus or Everlimus uh, versus Sutent different? So Everlimus and Sutent are both what we call targeted therapies so that they are um, oral pills and they have very specific mechanisms of action and what they do is they actually target the, the growth pathways, the molecular growth pathways uh, in the, the tumor cell, cells themselves, and perhaps also outside the tumor cells, preventing new blood vessel formation. Uh, in terms of how well they work, it, it, it's actually probably quite similar in, in terms of their efficacy against the tumor. But the way they work is different. Uh, Sutent falls in a class of drugs that we call angiogenesis inhibitors, so may primarily work on inhibiting new blood vessel formation. And Everlimus uh, is a class of drug called an NTOR inhibitor, so it targets a different pathway. And I guess the, the short answer here might be that these are both effective drugs. They work in very different ways. If one works, you can use the other, uh, and that's, so that's actually a good thing. Got it. Thank you. From Michael and a few other people, several other people, is it possible to spread the net uh, metastases in the liver by exercise or massage? I would say a short answer. We, we do not think so. Uh, and in fact, there's an increasing amount of evidence, not necessarily neuroendocrine tumor specific, mm -hmm. but in other areas that doing some of the good things like exercise, healthy diet may actually help in slowing tumor spread. Um, and if massage is going to make you feel better and calm you down and improve your mental state, then that might help too. Got it. Hey, thanks, Michael. Good to see you. From Eileen, should a newly diagnosed PNET routine, routinely get a dotatate scan uh, as part of a new workup? I think it's, it's going to depend a little bit. We were speaking earlier about uh, what we might consider really low risk uh, peanuts, the small, very well differentiated uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that potentially could be followed over the long term. And we think the risk of spread there is very, very low. Uh, but if we think that there's a possibility that it might have spread elsewhere, we generally would get a Dota Tate scan as part of an initial workup just to see where things may or may not be. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Eileen. From Eric, uh, do you use the Ren Labs net test? The, the, the net test gets back to the, I think, the initial question that we were uh, discussing at the beginning in terms of the need for better biomarkers in, in neuroendocrine tumors. Sure. Um, and we talked about the limitations here about chromogranin being the most commonly used biomarker, uh, one that we still use, but uh, as we just discussed, it's very imperfect and there is a huge need for better biomarkers. Um, I think the, the REN test, and I'll probably defer on whether or not I use it to avoid going down that road, 
uh, but I, I think it is an example of a, a new type of test that is based on genomics, based on genomic signatures, uh, for which there remains, I would say, a, a very great need in the neuroendocrine tumor world. Got it. Thank you. Hey, Eric, and this goes for you and anyone at really, like I mentioned at the top of the program, uh, all the hundreds of videos I've created for CCF, and we've done this show weekly for over two years, so over 100 episode, episodes of this, we have a whole database free library of content for you all to, to use, um, and specifically in this show, um, basically any topic we've touched on at some point, but in this show, the very first episode, this, so this was July of 2020, July 9th, 7th or 9th, we had on, uh, Dr. Modlin who created the net test. So if you want, there's, we get questions about this pretty frequently. So if you want specific information on that, literally, you don't, you can just scroll back to the beginning on YouTube and on Facebook. We have these videos broken down into playlists so you can go to the luncheon with the experts playlist go all the way back to the first one and that's going to be dr modlin and you can watch that and you'll have all the information that you can need on that in general and i am certainly not speaking like my opinion because I, I i this is not my my world but from the experience of hosting the show and asking uh you know people like dr Kolke about the net test you know the it seems to be a shared consensus that um, you know, people want a little bit more information on it. It's still relatively new. There's some exciting things about it, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of in that state where, um, you know, people, people want a little bit more information about it. Is that fair to say, Dr. Kolke? Like, I think that's fair. I, okay. You know, the, the idea here is, is, is really exciting and it's definitely yeah. the direction that a lot of these new biomarkers are going where exactly it fits in terms of the standard care, uh, probably remains open to debate in the field. Yeah. 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 Uh, thanks. Again. Thanks again, Eric. Uh, from Gail, I just had surgery to remove two tumors from my ovaries. They have now documented my record showing PSI 20 or greater. My question is, since I have an innumerable amount of tumors, will my diarrhea symptoms get worse? I do also get somatostatin 120 uh, milligrams monthly, and that that is the worst of my symptoms. Sorry to hear that, Gail. Dr. Kolke, any thoughts? Yeah, so I guess the, the, the you probably need a little bit more specific information about um, this this uh, particular case to to make a to comment on on whether or not some analogs are going to help whether the tumors are causing the diarrhea because there's so many different aspects to this. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know what I what I might say here is that the the ovary is not the most common spot for neuroendocrine tumors to occur. They absolutely can. Um, but just being sure it, it, it is what we're calling it because there are other types of cancer that can also arise in the ovary. And even in the neuroendocrine tumor sphere, you can have very low grade, well differentiated, slow growing tumors, and you can also have very aggressive tumors. And the treatments are gonna completely differ depending on what that is. Uh, so looking closely at the pathology and just being sure um, it is what we think it is would be important. Got it. Hey, thanks, Gail. And um, I'm not sure if you've been here in the show before, but your name looks um, doesn't look super familiar to me. So if, if it is your first time, welcome. And let me know if you have any other questions. We'd be happy to take them. T -t -t question from Judy. Um, if you don't have somatostatin receptors or santostatin, well, I was correct. I think, yes, she says Santa said. <laughs> How does that affect treatment options? How limited is it? And just for a little bit of um, context, it's a lung primary uh, stage four on the second line of treatment. Yeah, so uh, the discussion here perhaps even gets back. We talked a lot about some out of stand analogs at the beginning mm -hmm. and how we, we really like to use them as our first line treatment because of the benefits both with hormone secretion and in terms of slowing tumor growth. The, the challenge does come as in this situation, about 10% of the time, neuroendocrine tumors don't have receptors for the somatostatin analogs. So does it reduce the number of treatment options? It does. 
the, the good news here is that there are an increasing number of other treatment options becoming available for neuroendocrine tumors that are still options. And that could include cytotoxic chemotherapy, some of the targeted agents that we were discussing as well. So it does change it a little bit, but by no means does it mean that you're, you're severely limited in terms of the options that are available to you. Got it. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. Um, from Jerry, what are your thoughts on CAPTEM maintenance dosing frequency after completing 12 cycles? An, an unanswered question again. The uh, Temozolomide-based uh, chemotherapy has actually been a, a, a really wonderful good news story. Um, the, the word on the street, if you will, a while back was that neuroendocrine tumors don't respond to chemotherapy because they don't grow fast enough, et cetera. And that turned out not to be the case at all. And Temozolomide-based therapy can work really, really well um, in um, at least one third and probably more. Uh, cases of, of advanced neuroendocrine tumor. One of the things that can happen with long-term therapy, uh, and this is probably more related to the temozolomide, is that it, it can suppress your immune system as other mm -hmm. chemotherapies do. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to continue it on to the point where your immune system gets so suppressed and you start getting infections and other complications. So I think the decision as to how long to continue it needs to be individualized. There's no right or wrong. Um, but if you are going to continue it, be sure that um, you're at least aware and monitoring for some of these longer term side effects that really can be associated with uh, particularly temozolomide. Got it. Thanks so much for your question. Next one comes from our friend Tom. Tom says someone in our Wisconsin group was diagnosed locally with skin nets and none of us had ever heard of skin nets. And she went to Kentucky for a follow-up. What is known about skin nets, if anything? The um, skin nets, and I, I am wondering here because there is a type of neuroendocrine tumor that starts in the skin mm -hmm. called Merkel cell carcinoma. It, it falls in many ways in a very different category uh, so I, I would just check if, if, in fact, this is Merkel cell carcinoma, treat it. And that's, again, it's sort of a different basket, and there are specific treatments available for that. The other possibility, and this happens sometimes as well, is neuroendocrine tumors can metastasize to the skin. Not particularly common, but if that's the situation, then you would treat it as any other neuroendocrine tumor. Got it. Hey, Tom, uh, if you're still there, let us know if you have any other uh, clarification on that. Uh, from Perry, follow up on a previous question. What is the next treatment, potential next treatment, if the P if PRRT begins to show that it, it has stopped working or helping? This really depends on what the other prior treatments have been. I'm going to assume that it's not a standard analog, uh, not, not the, the PRRT. Um, is already on board. And um, it'll depend a little bit on whether it's a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor or, or other GI neuroendocrine tumor. Um, other options for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors would be CAPTEM, as we just discussed, uh, Eberlimus, Sunitinib, uh, as well as several other newer treatments that uh, may still be available now through clinical trials, but perhaps will become more broadly available down the road. So, right. so lots of options. And, and again, and, you know, the, the discussion here needs to be individualized. There is not yet, I would say, a, a standard sequence for all of these treatments. Yep, yep. I know that's something that's under constant debate as well. Exactly. <laughs> um, another one from Eric. Are somatostatin analogs helpful in well-differentiated grade, grade three net patients who do not show reactivity in the tumor tissue? Um, on gallium or copper 64 scans? So that, that for, for, for these treatments to work, the somatostatin analogs, they, they need to bind to somatostatin receptors. And the, the dotatate scan or the PET scans are, are actually quite sensitive. So if the scans are, are negative, I think that the chance that 
somatostat and analog is going to have real efficacy is probably relatively low. Uh, so we would not necessarily start with a somatostat and analog in that setting and probably lean towards another type of treatment. Got it. Thank you. Um, this next one is case specific, but I think we can answer or give some general advice here. Elaine says, my primary tumor was removed from small intestine four years ago. We've been treating the, the liver mets uh, ever since with octreotide, everlimus. Over four years, the tumors have barely grown, and doctors even consider them stone cold stable. Um, my doctor has now left the practice, and I was shifted to another doc in the practice who now who encourages me to undergo PRRT. Um, she looks at the amount of growth over time. Is, is this something that uh, you think Elaine should should consider? given that she's been stone cold stable for a while. This, this raises a really, really interesting phenomenon uh, that happens a lot uh, with, with our patients. The, 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 the way we're all trained as oncologists is you look and see if the tumors are growing or not. Right. Uh, so you'll get a scan today and then you'll get another one in six months and you'll compare those two and you see no change and you're like, oh, that's great. Uh, my treatment is working and, and all is good. We'll do another one in six months. What we don't routinely do uh, enough, I would say, is look at the current scan and then look at a scan four years ago to see what is happening there. Yeah. Because the time course can really be so long. So here again, this, there is not a right and a wrong uh, answer to this. Sometimes it might be okay for tumors to grow slowly if there are no symptoms whatsoever. But if we're starting to have symptoms or if that growth is really definitive, then I would say, yeah, looking at another treatment and whether it's PRT or embolization uh, is, is, is hard to say, but uh, it's worth looking at. Uh, yeah. So I think I would, I would just really keep that in mind because this, this happens all the time. Yeah. And Elaine, we we had a very similar question last week with Dr. Vijay Vergia from Fox Chase Medical Center, um, and and the same kind of sentiment was shared. Is since it's a slow growing disease, it, you know, it really has to be has to be looked at over time like that, and not just a couple of couple of um, of uh, of scans. So yeah, I think that's a great point. I appreciate your question. Lynn and a few other people. Well, Lynn has P PNET with Mets to, to the liver. She's hanging in there. Good to hear, Lynn. But disruptive sleep is an issue. And a few, it seems like a few other people share, share this as well. Are there any medications that might help that would not make the nets worse? Or I guess the symptoms worse? Yeah. The, so if, Yes, dis disruptive sleep seems to be the, 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 the main symptom here. And I guess the, the question would be, well, what is the cause of the disruptive sleep? There are obviously many potential causes. If it is pain or discomfort, um, certainly pain medication can help. Um, if it is anxiety, which is also very common and completely understandable under these circumstances, then maybe starting with, with an SSRI, one of the like a presence or, or even a, a sedative uh, in some cases might be appropriate. Um, you could even look at, at more, more natural uh, type uh, medications. Uh, melatonin, for example, can be beneficial for some people. So open to all of those things. I think I would say every single one of those possibilities I mentioned should be absolutely fine and should not have any adverse impact on the, the neuroendocrine growth whatsoever. Great, good to hear. Hope that helps, Lynn. From Jennifer, can you have facial flushing for other causes if you're currently NED, uh, non-functional lung primary uh, removed? A few other people interested in this as well. Yeah, the, the answer is, is yes. Um, and let me let me clarify, if there is really no tumor, and, and that may very well be the case here, it wouldn't be the tumor causing the facial flushing. There are lots of other reasons to have facial flushing. 
um, one that is brought up sometimes and, and unfortunately actually sometimes mistaken for or, or, or causes people to miss neuroendocrine tumors would be uh, menopause type symptoms. Um, but there are lots of other reasons for flushing that are not tumor related. Um, even a, a, a condition called autonomic neuropathy, uh, which is which is nerve related. Um, so the fact that there's flushing does not necessarily mean that there is a neuroendocrine tumor there, as long as you've checked and done the appropriate scans, et cetera. Got it. Thank you. From Mary, uh, I had a net resection in 2011, and I've had very slow growing nodule in the lung, which may be a net. The nodule is in a difficult spot and would require losing part of the lung. And there's no elevated markers. If the nodule is actually a net, how dangerous is it to wait and watch? And also, at what point must it be removed? So this is going to be a tough call. So I think, the um, again, um, this is really an individualized decision, and I would say based in large part on the, the risk risk of the surgery, uh, whether there are other conditions that might make surgery more risky or less risky. Um, do lung nodules that are not growing or slowly growing always need to be removed? Not necessarily. Uh, might a biopsy to see if what exactly this is be helpful, perhaps. Uh, so I would say no, no right or wrong, uh, but, but this is a, a tough call. Got it. Thank you. I uh, appreciate your question, Mary. Let me know if you have a follow-up to that. Uh, try to get you some help. Miranda says, I've seen conflicting information out there with uh, with a stage four primary in the appendix. Is it rare to see metastases to the liver? The appendiceal tumors, if they are going to spread, often spread not to the liver but to what we call the peritoneum, the, the lining of the abdomen. And, and that's really because the appendix is kind of sticking out there in the abdominal cavity and cells can directly spread out. That said, is it unusual to see them go to the liver? Not necessarily. Uh, that would be sort of the next place to look. Um, kind of a... Um, uh... Found, you know, fundamental question about PRT. What are the what are the most common risks and side effects for PRT? Um, PRT is is generally really really well tolerated, and, and you know, certainly no no picnic. But compared to some of the other treatments that cancer patients in general need to undergo, uh, it's a it's a great great option. Uh, there there can be some immediate side effects on the day of treatment. Sometimes there can be a little bit of nausea, which at least has been related more to, to the, the IV fluids and amino acids that are being given rather than to the actual PRT. Uh, and increasingly, we figured out how to um, avoid that. And with some of the newer preparations, even that is much less of an issue than it had been in the past. There can be some other longer term side effects. And I would say the one that we monitor most for are effects on the bone marrow and blood counts on platelets on white count. Um, and in rare situations, those effects can be uh, a little bit more severe. In general though, uh, the, the side effect profile of PRC has, has really been excellent. And at least our patients have done great with it. It's good to hear, appreciate your question. Elaine, um, Ron says, uh, initially diagnosed with a grade one net and small bowel and liver. If and when tumors return, what are the chances they could be grade three? I would say chances are, are pretty low. Uh, there certainly are situations where the, the tumor histology might be mixed and, and you can even have situations where part of the tumor is grade one and then you look at another part of the tumor and it's grade three. Uh, ultimately, it's really the test of time uh, that is going to tell you exactly what, what is happening. But it's relatively unusual for if it really is all grade one, if it were to come back for it to, to look that different. Um, generally, 
what you get at the beginning is pretty similar to, to what you get if and when it comes back. I'd say hopefully it doesn't come back in this situation. Got it. Thank you. Folks, we have just a little bit more than 10 minutes left with Dr. Kolke, so keep sending those questions in, and we're going to do our best to get to as many of them as possible. From Bill, is Keytruda being used for NET or NEC? So Keytruda is uh, an immunotherapy, so the really hot, exciting, not even so new anymore cancer treatment that uh, I would really say has revolutionized revolutionize the treatment of lots and lots of different cancers. Um, for uh, neuroendocrine tumors, what we know so far is that uh, the, the checkpoint inhibitors immunotherapy can be helpful for the aggressive, sort of poorly differentiated uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas. Um, and we have used uh, checkpoint inhibitors in that situation. We've seen them work and trials have also uh, shown activity in that context. The harder question right now and the open question is how these types of treatments might be helpful for the lower grade, slower growing neuroendocrine tumors. And that's an area where there are still clinical trials ongoing. Uh, it sounds like there, there may be a little bit more to the story that we need to figure out to get immunotherapy to work in that particular context. Got it. Thank you. Um, next question is an easy one. Is Dr. Koki still seeing patients? I am seeing patients, as are my colleagues here. So happy to see you. All right, Mary, good luck. Uh, and folks, <laughs> we'll, try, we'll try to add some contact information in the comment section as well. From Carrie, if an atypical carcinoid in the lower bronchial tube was removed by a lower left sleeve lobectomy in a 19-year-old, and pathology showed after surgery, no cancer cells. What is the likelihood of spread in the future because of them being so young? The, the first thing to say here is that the, the likelihood of spread um, really has nothing to do with, with the age. Um, so I, I think you can take that out of the equation for, for, for better or for worse. The, the key um, is, is probably related to the grade and the characteristics of the tumor. Is this a, a rapidly growing high-grade tumor or is it truly a, a slow-growing a slow growing low-grade tumor? As we were just discussing, uh, sometimes even closely looking at the pathology doesn't give you the whole story. Um, so I, you know, close follow-up here. Uh, and I think uh, hopefully, as, as certainly happens in, in some situations, um, this has been removed and, and won't come back. Got it. Thank you. Uh, question from Jade. My questions are the links between net or carcinoid and hypermobility and collagen defect. Have you seen any connection with epithelial keratin, cytokeratin, cytoskeleton, collagen with hypermobility and NETS carcinoid tumors? I would, I would have to say I have not seen that association and I'm, I, I will sort of go back and just think of, you know, the, my own personal experience here. I don't know of literature, um, not something that immediately. Let me, there's a, couple other questions within it and uh, I want to try to help her. Uh, can hypermobility cause keratin disorder further causing abnormal epithelial differentiation increasing the risk of carcinoid tumors based on the collagen encoded defects I would say <laughs> either not known or I'm, I'm not sure yeah yeah sorry Jade I'm uh, uh, not sure um, but uh, let me know if you have any other questions really want to try to help we just uh you know we talked a little bit about lynn chime back in and, uh, about the um any sleep medication that might help and it was you know because of anxiety and i've had someone else chime in too about uh what you might recommend for anxiety um any thoughts on that? I mean, Wendy says, I just went off uh, Alprazolam after being on it for 15 years. Um, I know that these aren't necessarily patients of yours, but any general advice about uh, medication for anxiety? Yeah, you know, the, the, the thing that a lot of people are 
are reluctant. A, a lot of the, the medications are stigmatized, if you will, and let's go Indeed. for SSRIs, antidepressants. Uh, and one thing I, I will often say, because we, we get this a lot from, from patients and I'm having trouble sleeping, I'm anxious. Uh, and just think about it. You, you've been diagnosed with neuroendocrine tumor and sure, uh, maybe it's, it's better than being diagnosed with some other type of cancer. But the other reality and something that can be really tough is that you can live with these tumors for years and years and years. And that's a difficult position to be in. Um, it's not something that's common that you can share easily with other people. And it is going to cause anxiety and, and all kinds of effects. It, this, is, this is not easy. Um, and I am really a, a big proponent of, of treating those symptoms, being open uh, to treating symptoms of anxiety, depression, uh, and just taking good care of yourself in that context. Uh, so I, you know, I think, again, there, there are lots of different options here. Uh, I would be open to, uh, to looking at those uh, and, and just being sure you're taking good care of yourself. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, this is not necessarily, this is not a question for you, Dr. Kolke, but uh, Gail says, I had mentioned her thinking she was new earlier. She's not new. I like to listen and read. I received net care at Mayo uh, under Dr. Jason Starr, who's spoken here. So it sounds like you're in good hands, Gail, but I just, I still wanted to say, hey, and I'm glad that you uh, you spoke up today. Dr. Starr is awesome. We have definitely had him on here before. Um, there was one I just lost. Yes, from Pat. My husband has peanuts with metastases to the liver. He has been on cabozantinib for the last nine weeks and is feeling very good. That's great to hear, Pat. Have you seen uh, good res other good results with this clinical trial drug? And I know a lot of people are interested in this right now. Yeah, so uh, cabozantinib is, is uh, one of the treatments. It's actually probably furthest along in, uh, in terms of, of development. Um, you know, we had talked before about lots of new drugs being developed in this space. Uh, and the short answer is um, yes. The, it was actually involved in, in the first phase two trial of cabozantinib, and it resulted in, in really good tumor shrinkage, let's say in 20 to 25% of patients with either carcinoid or peanut. Um, so that was an early trial, and the, the fact that it really showed very promising activity there led to what's now a large randomized trial that's ongoing. Uh, and if that confirms the activity, hopefully this will become a, a, a more standard treatment across the board for uh, patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Got it, thank you. Another uh, kind of fundamental question, which I always like to ask in case you know people are new to this disease. Allison says, we had mentioned earlier NETs, her NET and NEC. What is the difference between those two? Can you uh, clarify the differentiation? This is a uh, something that comes up that we talk about with our trainees a lot too. Um, the terminology in neuroendocrine tumors, neuroendocrine carcinoma is, is really confusing. And not only is it confusing, it seems to change every few years. I have to say, I'm not even sure I keep track of what the current definition is or not. And what I tell our trainees, and I think I would tell all of our patients as well, don't worry so much about whether the last word is tumor or carcinoma. What it really comes down to is that you look at the KI-67, the grade and the mitotic rate, and, and there is a spectrum as with everything else in life. Um, these, these really fall along a, a whole range um, and I think with those markers, that's really what we ask people to look at in terms of sort of determining where you fit on the on the curve of neuroendocrine tumors. Got it. Thank you. Um, I have several questions. Gonna, I'm going to try to compile them into one or just get some information out of you for it. Um, it's basically about the rounds of PRRT. And in the States, it's a little bit different in other places. Kara says, have you had any patients that have had additional PRRT treatments beyond the initial four? And then Jennifer says, what, you know, what are the U.S. standards? I've seen variations of up to five and six treatments in one session. In Europe, it's more common to do four sessions of four. So we can talk a little bit about the standardization 
but then also, uh, you know, is is it helpful? Is there anything that's shown it's helpful to continue it after that? Like, where, where what do you think about any of that? Yeah, well, really uh, an open question as well. I think I, I could say a, a few things there. So yeah, the, the standard approach here in the States and what's been FDA approved and presumably that relates to insurance coverage mm -hmm. is the four rounds of PRT. And by the end of four rounds, most people are probably ready to take a break and that's probably fine. Uh, the question is, can further PRT down the road potentially be helpful? I think the answer there is yes. And as you mentioned here, they've been doing that in Europe for a while. Uh, exactly the approach and dose is probably still being worked out. Uh, so I would say this is, is still a, a bit of an open question. Um, it probably can be helpful. I think in certain situations, it absolutely has been helpful. Do we all know exactly the best way to do that and where to draw the line? Um, still an open question there. Got it. Thank you so much, folks. I think... Um... Let's see if there's another question yet uh, left. Well, they, I, I, I'll give you one for me that I always like to ask uh, at the end of at the end of the episodes. For a first time patient, you know, we've talked about a lot of different uh, aspects of this disease today, and I know for a lot of people it can be confusing. Even back to the last question about NEC and NET. If someone was recently diagnosed last week, this week, whatever, what's the first bit of advice that you would give them to to you know, to give themselves the best chance to approach this in the correct manner, like for that person who's scared, confused, what do you tell them? The first thing I usually tell people, and that sort of relates to the, the terminology here, uh, we all talk about neuroendocrine tumors now. Uh, in the past, we called a lot of these carcinoids. And if you look at the history of carcinoid, why is it called carcinoid? It's actually called carcinoid based on the term carcinoma, which is cancer. And it was called carcinoid because, yeah, it's cancer, but it's like cancer. It's carcinoid, it's not carcinoma. So in many cases, it, it falls in this gray area. And, and that is what can be really challenging when you first get the diagnosis. How do you think about it? Uh, so the, the message here is this, this, this really can be different from other cancers. Um, it is the kind of condition, if you will, that you can live with for years and years and years and live very, very well. Uh, and that is sort of the, the goal of treatment. The other message, it can be hard sometimes to find information, but there really are a lot of treatments available. You don't have to get every single treatment at once. You can sequence them over time. The other hard thing to get your head around. Uh, so I think there is room for optimism here. The important thing that we tell everyone is it's not so much the exact treatment or what sequence you get the treatment in. The most important thing is just be sure you have access to these treatments and, and are getting uh, access to everything that really is available out there and all the things that are coming down the line. Which seems to be quite a bit, a lot of activity going on right now. So right. it's, ex it's right. exciting times. Folks, that is our hour today. Thank you for uh, being patient with us and sticking around. Uh, for those that could, Alicia says, thank you, Dr. Kolke. I am very impressed, as we all are, sir. I appreciate you spending some time with us today and sharing your insights, your wisdom, your knowledge, your experience. Thanks, thanks so much for being back on the show. Great. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to all of you out there. It's a real pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you to all, all of you indeed, and we hope this uh, program helped answer some of your questions. I'll reiterate one more time. You can uh, reach out to CCF at carcinoid.org or here on the Facebook page if you have follow-up questions. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without their support, we couldn't do the show. Finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching, and please join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy. Stay safe, everyone.